Good morning, everyone. I have a confession to make. In my 10 years in Montreal, I did something that many of you might find quite upsetting. I, uh, I broke up with the Calgary Flames. <laughs> it happened about seven years ago. And to be honest, though, we just kind of grew apart. I was tired of staying up till the wee hours of the morning to, uh, to watch them play. And um, it was really tough, especially when most of those evenings were ended in great disappointment. But uh, I think as far as breakups go, it was pretty painful, painless. We're still friends. I still wish them well. Um, but I did move on, and I embraced a new team. I, I went native. I, uh, I'm, I, my heart belongs to the Habs now. That's the first time I've ever been booed in the pulpit. <laughs> I soon realized that I was just trading, however, one dysfunctional relationship for another. <laughs> but that's the fun, one of the fun things about sport, isn't it? Um, having that kind of rise and fall of, of, of emotions. There's another great thing about sport. That, and I think this applies whether you're a participant or a spectator. And that's a sport is a great uh, reminder of our ongoing quest to get better. For many of us, that pursuit of achievement and records and championships is uh, it captures our imagination. Uh, that competitive spirit is uh, is something that burns to varying degrees in all of us, some more than others. Um, it provides. This, in this way, I think sport provides a really good metaphor, many good metaphors for life. And um, one of those metaphors is that uh, many times when an athlete or a team hits the skids, there's something going wrong, they do something called getting back to the basics. And this is when the game gets simplified. The, uh, the focus is put, is put on the bare essence of that sport. And any complications, any distractions, just they get put to the side. Well, we've been getting back to the basics this month with our spiritual lives. The last two weeks, Jason's been helping us get back to the basics of just reading Scripture, getting into God's Word. And today we're going to get back to the basics with another essential part of our spiritual lives, and that's prayer. We're kicking off our week of prayer here uh, in uh, this, the coming days. Now, to anchor our thoughts on prayer... We're going to look at a parable that Jesus told about prayer in Luke 18. I invite you to turn there right now if you want to follow along in your Bible. Now, if we're going to get back to the basics in prayer, um, we need to maybe simplify things by asking some back-to-the-basic questions. So we're going to ask a series of questions uh, while we're looking at this parable in Luke, and hopefully, I'm pretty confident that these uh, what we see in Luke 18 is going to point us to some good answers to these basic questions. And when we're done looking at the questions in the context of this parable, we're going to take a few minutes this morning uh, to put what we're learning about prayer into practice and have a time of prayer. Now, we're going to be doing a little bit of alone time in prayer. We're going to do a little bit of talking side by side and partnering up. If that's a little bit scary for you, take heart. Uh, no matter how inexperienced or comfortable and experienced we are at praying, I think this parable hits us where we are. There, is, there are takeaways that apply whether we're inexperienced at prayer or we've been longtime prayer warriors. And the same will go for our prayer time at the end. No matter if you've never really prayed before or if you've been doing it your whole life, this little exercise will be simple and, I believe, meaningful for all of us. So to get us started, let's ask the question, what does it mean to be a Christian? So starting in the first verse of Luke 18, let's read, and maybe this answer will pop out to you. One day Jesus told his disciples a story to show how they should always pray and never give up. There was a judge in a certain city, he said, who neither feared God nor cared about people. A widow of that city came to him repeatedly, saying, Give me justice in this dispute with my enemy. 
The judge ignored her for a while, but finally he said to himself, Enough already! I don't fear God or care about people, but this woman is driving me crazy. I'm going to see that she gets justice because she's wearing me out with her constant requests. Then the Lord said, Learn a lesson from this unjust judge. Even he rendered a just decision in the end. So don't you think God will surely give justice to his chosen people who cry out to him day and night? Will he keep putting them off? I tell you, he will grant justice to them quickly. But when the Son of Man returns, how many will he find on earth who have faith? So what does it mean? In essence, back to the basics, what does it mean to be a Christian? The back to the basics answer to that is that being a Christian is simply having a relationship with God through his son, Jesus. Now, that isn't explicit in this parable that Jesus told. But let's look at the way that Jesus told this parable. He contrasts a rather distant relationship between a widow and a judge with the relationship that God has with his chosen people. Let's stop for a minute and look at this widow. She's vulnerable and exposed. Uh, picture a 30-something single mom. Her roof in her apartment is leaking. The windows are drafty. There's little bugs in the carpeting, and it's, all this is making her kids sick. And her landlord isn't doing anything to help her. She doesn't have enough money to do this, to fix these things herself. And so her only choice is to go to this judge. She has no choice but to be persistent. So that brings us to the judge. He's her only source of help, and he doesn't care one bit. He kind of reminds me of that TV character, Dr. House. He's pathologically self-interested. He didn't care that this poor lady was vulnerable. He didn't care what God thought about him. He didn't even care about his reputation with other people. In the end, he just simply gives in because this widow wore him out. She was persistent. Not exactly a warm relationship, right? But Jesus says, not so with God. If the widow can get help from Dr. House by persistently annoying him, how much more will God help his chosen people? Jesus is assuming a basic relationship between God and his people. Elsewhere, throughout the Gospels, Jesus refers to God as Father. It only makes sense. When you're in a close relationship, you want to help. You will help. And as crazy as this may sound, we Christians believe it's possible to have a personal relationship with the almighty creator of the universe because Jesus Christ lived, died, and rose again. Through Jesus, trusting him as savior, following him as example, it's actually possible to embrace a relationship with God. And it comes with all kinds of blessings. What did Jesus say? I tell you, God will grant justice, and quickly. He won't keep putting them off. God's people who call out to him day and night have his ear. But how does that work? I, I'm a physical human being, and God is spirit. How on earth can I have a personal relationship and cross so many divides that 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 situation presents? Well, this leads to a second basic question. How did Jesus relate to God? If Jesus is our Savior, if Jesus is our example, how did Jesus relate to God the Father? Well, one person I've been reading is a fellow named Sundar Krishnan. He is an Alliance pastor in Toronto, and he teaches and writes extensively about things of the Spirit and, and on prayer. And Sunder tells a story about a time when he went on sabbatical. And so to take a break from church work, he decides to go take a course on prayer. This, and this course just happened to be taught by uh, Dr. Eugene Peterson. If that name sounds familiar, it's because he's the man behind the translation of the Bible called The Message. And so this was back in the day. This, he took this course back in the day before we had PowerPoint and, and all kinds of fancy uh, technology to communicate. 
And um, Dr. Peterson walks up to the front and uh, at, at the beginning of this course on prayer, and he goes to the overhead projector, and on the little cellophane thing with a marker, he writes, Jesus prays. And he says, these two words, Jesus prays, is the foundation of all Christian prayer, all Christian spiritual practice. And you don't have to read very far in the Gospels to discover that prayer was a primary way that God related, that Jesus related to God the Father. Uh, he often went alone to pray. If you look in Matthew 14, he went alone to, to pray just before he uh, walked on water to save his disciples from the storm. Luke 6 tells of a time where he spent the whole night in prayer before he chose his 12 apostles. Uh, John 17, we get this really intimate and privileged look into the prayer life of Jesus as he prays for his disciples, as he prays for us. Jesus related to God through prayer. And if th I guess if that's the case, prayer is vitally important. This is assumed by Luke when he shares this parable with us. And he starts this parable. He says, we should always pray. Listen to how uh, Sundar sums it up. Here's the staggering implication. If Jesus, fully God and man, so he had that tension between physical and spiritual, if Jesus, fully God and man, loved by the Father with infinite love and full of the Holy Spirit without measure, if he saturated, saturated his whole life in prayer and has continued to pray for us for more than 2,000 years, we have absolute assurance that prayer is never a wasted effort. Part of the lesson of the widow is that if it takes persistence, even when it, it takes persistence, it's never, prayer is never a wasted effort. Prayer was of prime importance in Jesus' life, and therefore it's vital. And yet, prayer is tough. How many of us feel really good about our prayer lives? How many of us feel really adequate? That's good. Some of us do. And I'm very grateful. I'm jealous of you. Because <laughs> if there's one thing that I've learned, and I, I learned this especially while I was living in a Francophone environment, is that there's two things that I'll never be good enough at, and that's speaking French <laughs> and prayer. <laughs> it's just two of those constant reminders that I always have room for improvement. And I, 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 and I search, search for those moments where it was like, oh, I had a good French day. Or, oh, yeah, I really felt like I met with God in a deep, profound way. But it's tough. It doesn't always work that way. Prayer can be overwhelming. It can be strange. It can be not very rewarding at times. Maybe the reason for this is we don't understand what prayer actually is. That leads us to yet another question. What is prayer? At the risk of oversimplifying it, I'll work with the, the idea that prayer, in essence, is just communication with God. Now, when you think about communication in all of your relationships, if you're like me, you kind of groan inwardly and go, oh, man. Communication in relationships is never easy. Let me share with you a couple of reasons or a couple of ways that prayer, is that, that prayer is challenging because it, it's a form of communication. So it's paralleling communication with prayer. Firstly, we communicate in many diverse ways, and the same goes for our relationship with God. We can communicate with Him in very diverse ways as well. One type of communication that we uh, see demonstrated by the widow is in, this, in this parable is petition. Sometimes our prayers can take on this form, especially when we're being treated unfairly or we have a big problem in our life. We bring this to God and we petition Him, do something about this. There is, however, a lot more to communication than just petition. There should be a lot more to our prayer life than just asking for stuff. Let's consider for a minute the ultimate book of prayer in, uh, that we have in the Bible, and that's the Psalms. Pastor Larry read one of those Psalms to us this morning. Um, it contains many different kinds of psalms. And I've got a, uh, a little pie chart that I've, I've uh, compiled here, just breaking down in broad categories all the different kinds of psalms. Now, there's other categories, but these are kind of the broad ones. 
But if you look, there's like a whole bunch of different kinds of ways of praying. And um, I, I think a particular note, you look at the one that's 40%, 41%, those are the laments. These are prayers expressing grief. These are prayers that are expressing, it is not well with my soul. I, I don't know about you, but that tells me something profound. That no matter what's bothering me, whatever bone to pick that I have with God, I don't have to be shy about sharing them. The people writing the Psalms weren't shy about it. God's a big boy. He can take our griefs. Actually, I think he takes them on better than anybody else could. So why wouldn't he be our first go-to person with our, with our problems and our grief? But suffice it to say, there are just many different forms of communication, even in prayer. It takes effort and practice to get good at all these different forms. Second of all, not only is prayer diverse, but as with all forms of communication, learning to pray is a process. We go through all kinds of learning processes when it comes to communication. If we were to really look at the story here and, and, and maybe connect some of the dots of this parable, somewhere along the line, the widow figured out that if she's going to get anything done, she's going to have to persist. So Jesus doesn't tell us that she figured this out, but somewhere along the line, she had to have. And she went through a process of learning that. Maybe it was many times of realizing that uh, the judge was not listening to her, or even before that, the landlord wasn't listening to her. Whoever it was, whoever her enemy was that was um, causing her grief, her experiences brought her through the process that led her to the decision and said, now I need to persist. We all go through learning processes. Right from the moment that we're born, we're learning to talk. The more we practice, the more able we are to express our thoughts. We start with a word, and then later on we get good at forming sentences, and pretty soon we're able to communicate larger ideas and, uh, and interact with the world around us. Prayer can start the same way. You don't have to have much experience with prayer uh, because it can start with a single word. Father, help, yes, thank you. Even a single word when it's directed to God can be a profound prayer. Another area where we go through this learning process can be in the area of romance. There's a progression to the way you communicate with your partner. And you have to get to know each other first before certain forms of communication are appropriate. Intimate terms of endearment, if you use them too soon, they can earn you a slap in the face or a beverage thrown in your direction. Or so I'm told. It's never happened to me before. So as with all communication, prayer is diverse and it's a learning process. It takes effort and practice to become effective at communicating with God. And since prayer is that way, that, that example that Jesus taught us how to, how to relate to him, it's vitally important. And so that's really what this week of prayer is all about. We want to create an environment where we have opportunities practice and learn the different forms of prayer. And so, just to kind of give a little summary here of the different types of prayer that we're going to be learning about and, and practicing this week, there's meditating on Scripture. Tomorrow night, when we have Lectio Divina for dummies, we're going to practice that. Blessing is a form of prayer. And on Tuesday, we're going to be practicing that. And that's one where, as far as event logistics goes, it's been taking a little bit of coordination. It's not too late. If you want somebody to pray a blessing over your household, it's not too late. You can talk to Pastor Larry or myself after the service, and we'll make sure that you get set up. Men, uh, many, a number of people have uh, already expressed an interest in that, and we're getting you all lined up for Tuesday. And also, if you feel like, man, I want to be a blessing, I want to pray that blessing, 
there's time for you to be able to uh, engage in that too. Just let Larry and I know. Worship is another form of prayer. And on Wednesday, the Youth Exalt Night, there's going to be worship. Actually, all different forms of prayer. That in itself is going to be a whole other experience. Uh, Jason uh, Dimnick's been show, t- explaining to me some of the different prayer exercises that he's going to be uh, leading. And, and it, that in itself is going to be a whole education in different kinds of prayer that, that uh, you, you find very, uh, very helpful. Thursday night, we're going to have a worship and prayer night uh, again. Another form of prayer is intercession. And on Friday, when we go for that prayer drive, who knows, with the Chinooks are good, maybe people will want to walk. I don't know. But uh, that intercession is really at the heart of what that prayer drive or prayer walk is all about. Going into your community and just praying for the people in, those communi- in, in your community. Public ceremony is actually another form of prayer. I don't know about you, but one of the most prayerful times of the year is on November 11th on Remembrance Day when we have a very solemn assembly, a very solemn time of prayer and reflection. Ceremony. Uh, back, going back to the uh, liturgical psalms, there are a whole bunch of psalms written just for public ceremony. And so we're going to be putting that into practice next Sunday when we have a communion and healing time. And so there's so many different ways to uh, express prayer, and we want to try and, and, and uh, practice and learn about all, uh, as, many, uh, as many different kinds in the coming week. Uh, one other opportunity that some of you have already uh, signed up for is just the whole getting, learning the whole practice of hearing God's voice. We're going to be doing a five-week course on hearing God. It's going to start on Sunday, February 8th, after the, the second service, and you're welcome to uh, sign up with me for that, and we're going to go through that together. So it's not just something ext- uh, limited to just to the week of prayer. Now, to kick things off, we're going to do a little prayer exercise here. Uh, I'm going to invite the ushers. If you could uh, get to, um, grab the uh, prayer journals that we've prepared and pass them out, We've got a little experiment that I'm going to encourage you all to participate in this week called the Gratitude Experiment. And uh, the ushers are handing out little gratitude journals. Now, part of the inspiration for this is, uh, I don't know if this uh, twigs in your mind or at all or not, but last Monday was Blue Monday. And it just seems like this is the time of year where life seems to be just a little tougher. And one of the best ways to... uh, To work that through and deal with it is to have some gratitude. In fact, uh, Pastor Larry was just talking about how uh, his former boss at the counseling center was just on the radio last week talking about how how to deal with Blue Monday, and she was there on the radio saying, you know, just being grateful for things in life, these are the things that help you work through the the blueness of this season. And so we're going to do a gratitude experiment this week. So for, I've, I've planned out seven psalms, one for every day. And all of these psalms are praise psalms. These are psalms of thanksgiving and celebration of what God has done for us. So to kick things off this morning, we're going to do the first of the seven psalms. And I'm going to invite you to continue in this practice for the rest of the week to read a psalm and then just journal your response. And as you read these psalms of praise and see all these examples and reasons to praise God, I'm hoping, I'm counting on it twigging some reasons in your life that you can, you can uh, journal about to thank God for as well. Uh, one little technical detail. As we were preparing for this and uh, printing out these journals, our photocopier conked out at the end of the week and the, the technician isn't able to give it the full fix until Monday. And as a result, we have about half as many journals as I wanted to have. So if if you could share them as a household, uh, I would really appreciate that. But we're going to be, even though we don't have all the paper that I wanted, we're going to be persistent today. So what does it mean to be a Christian? It means to, to be in relationship with God through Jesus. And the tension of how does a physical human being relate to a spirit God Well, the question is, how did Jesus do that? He did it through prayer. And what is prayer? It's communication. Communication isn't easy. It takes effort and and it takes practice 
This is because it's diverse. There's many different ways to communicate. And it's also because as human beings, we have to learn to communicate and get better at it over time. And um, that's all there is to, to know about prayer, right? Wrong. There's something niggling away. I don't know if you, if in answering these three questions, I don't know if it niggles away at you, but it niggles away at me. There's something that bothers me. Luke's, Luke wrote at the very beginning of this proverb that we should be persistent and always pray and never give up. And if this is all what prayer is about, I'm still left with the question, why? If I'm persistent like the widow and Jesus is promising that God will give me what I need or what I want so that I can get back to my comfortable life and, and, uh, and kind of get back to normal, back to business as usual, is that, really, is that really what God wants? Is that really what prayer is about? Why, why would I pray? I think as I've been thinking about this, there's a clue that Jesus gives at the end of this parable that helps maybe give a bigger idea of what persistence looks like. It's not just about getting what you want or getting what you need. Because you think about it, how much do you think that widow had to do with the, the judge after she got her, her justice? You think she ever talked to him again? You really think that that's God's end game with us? That, oh yeah, enough already, just get out of my hair. There's a clue as to where God, what God's end game really is. And that's in the last verse of this parable. Jesus asks a very vulnerable question. He says, when the Son of Man returns, how many will he find on earth who have faith? That question points to a larger context. Remember Jason was teaching us about when you read the Bible, you got to take things in context? Well, that question puts this whole parable in the context of the conversation that Jesus was having in chapter 17. They were talking about the coming of the kingdom and the, the, uh, the, the, the second coming of the Son of Man. And there's a lot of really heavy stuff in there, but one thing about it is that if the one thing about it is that it's going to be sudden. In verse 30, Jesus says, Yes, it will be business as usual right up to the day when the Son of Man is revealed. On that day, a person out on the deck of a roof must not go down into the house to pack. A person out in the field must not return. And he goes on to talk about how the, 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 when the Son of Man returns, it's going to be sudden. Life will be going on, business as usual, and we're all going to be taken by surprise. The widow persistently pursued justice, and she got it, and she went back to business as usual. And then Jesus asked the question, when the Son of Man returns, how many are really going to have faith? You know, behind that question, I think, is God's, there's a, there's a picture of God's desire He's hoping that we come to him. He longs to share a love relationship with us. You, you go back to the Garden of Eden. He created human beings so that they could enjoy the cool of the evening together and, and just hang out together. So God's end game is so much more than just meeting a need or testing uh, to see whether or not someone will stick it out. He wants to meet with us. So when we make our business as usual more about seeking God, we're getting closer and closer to the heart of what God is looking for. And so as we go into this prayer exercise now, we're going to do two things. But overall of that, I hope we enter into it with this idea that maybe this is a first step towards making it a business as usual type of prayer practice in our lives. First, we're going to take some time and listen to the psalm as I read it. And I encourage you just to journal your thoughts quietly of some things that you're grateful for. And then we're going to partner up in pairs and we're going to just talk through 
a few of the questions that Jason encouraged us to talk about a couple of weeks ago. So, just listen. We're going to start with Psalm 138, and just listen to these words of praise. I give you thanks, O Lord, with all my heart. I sing your praises before the gods. I bow before your holy temple as I worship. I praise your name for your unfailing love and faithfulness. For your promises are backed by all the honor of your name. As soon as I pray, you answer me. You encourage me by giving me strength. Every king in all the earth will thank you, Lord, for all of them will hear your words. Yes, they will sing about the Lord's ways, for the glory of the Lord is very great. Though the Lord is great, he cares for the humble, but he keeps his distance from the proud. Though I am surrounded by troubles, you protect me from the anger of my enemies. You reach out your hand, and the power of your right hand saves me. The Lord will work out his plans for my life. For your unfailing love, O Lord, endures forever. Don't abandon me, for you have made me. Let's just take a minute to quietly ponder those words. And just make note, maybe if you don't have paper on your mobile device or wherever, but, or maybe just a mental note. Just but note some of the things that you can be thankful for to God. I hope I'm cutting you short. Because that means you have stuff that you're grateful for. I want you to continue to do this this week. What I'd like for us to do next is just partner up, pair off with somebody, and I'm going to ask you to do two things. The first thing is, is just share one of the things that you noted to yourself now, so one of the things that you're grateful for, and share those things with each other. And the next thing that I would encourage you to do is just take a look at these three questions. I, what you've got in your hand is, is, is a plan. Maybe that's the plan. Maybe you already have a plan that you're using. Great. But what you have in your hand is a plan to work through seven psalms of Scripture. And we've already worked through the first one. Talk with your partner about those three questions, about what plan do you want to use, when you're going to do it, and who's going to help you along the way, and, uh, and go from there. So those are the two things. Just share your gratitude thing and talk further about your plan. This was special time. Every time we get together to worship, it's special time. And as we go, I don't know if you're going back to business as usual, or maybe you're dealing with something like uh, a crisis or a problem, just like the widow was facing. If you are, you're welcome to stay and persist in prayer. We have people that would love to meet you at the front here and, and pray through those things with you. But whether it's business as usual or to some problem, I pray that you will go and you will persist in your prayer and that you would grow in communication with the God, the maker of the universe. And as you do that, I trust that you will encounter a God that's waiting for you with loving, opening arms. Go in peace.